The Earth currently supports over 7 billion humans. Each person requires a share of the planet's finite resources, and each contributes to climate change and pollution. As more nations join the industrialized first world, the more each person will draw from the pool of available global resources, and the more they will compound the anthropogenic impact on our little blue dot. The biblical directive to be fruitful and multiply now presents arguably the single most dangerous behavior for the future of humanity. The fate of humanity is tied to many factors, energy, climate change, pollution, and accessibility to water and food are critical, but each of these variables is linked inextricably with one main problem, population growth. As the renowned author, economist, scientist, activist, and philosopher Kenneth Boulding noted decades ago, anyone who believes that exponential growth can go on forever in a finite world is either a madman or an economist. In order for modern society to function, it needs energy, and a lot of it. Currently, we rely almost exclusively on finite fossil fuels to supply this need, but those resources are depleting rapidly. Data from the U.S. Energy Information Administration shows that world crude oil production peaked in May 2005. Saudi production also peaked in 2005 and the Kuwaiti oil authorities cut their official estimates of reserves in half. Mexico's largest field, Cantarell, is also in decline and North Sea production is said to be in freefall. Half the major oil producing countries are now experiencing declines. Present or recent senior officers of ExxonMobil, Shell, BP, Total, Chevron, Iranian Petroleum, Occidental, the European Union, and the IEA have warned that the conventional petroleum reserve estimates are too high and that an oil crunch is upon us or imminent. A German think tank has published an estimate of world coal reserves astonishingly more pessimistic than previous estimates. In the best case scenario, world coal production will peak around 2025 at 30% above present production. Production in China, the major consumer, will start to decline within the next 10 years. It now consumes over 40% of the world production and is on track to consume more than the rest of the world combined within several years. Even in the United States, with the world's largest claimed reserves, it's very likely that bituminous coal production has already peaked and that total volumetric coal production will peak between 2020 and 2030. Coal use is expected to increase in order to replace energy demand currently satisfied by petroleum, so world reserve estimates are grim. Additionally, coal produces more greenhouse gases, so increased use will accelerate global warming. The IPCC reports an acceleration of the rise of sea levels. Most of the stabilization scenarios envisage peak CO2 emissions between 2020 and 2060. Those scenarios would raise global average temperatures 3.2 to 4 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels and sea levels by nearly 2.5 meters. There's been dramatic glacial melt in Greenland and West Antarctica and unparalleled melting of the Arctic pack ice. Climate change has made it more likely that the Amazon basin will experience severe droughts, which suggests a potential feedback that would swiftly turn the rainforests into a source rather than a sink of CO2 and further drive global warming. A two degree centigrade global temperature warming by mid-century, which even the most optimistic scenarios foresees, would cause a 20 to 80 percent loss of Amazon rainforest, increasing drought in mid-latitudes and semi-arid low latitudes. It would dramatically increase water stress and cause reduced grain production in many countries like China and India. Vehicle emissions are among the leading causes of air pollution. Principal stationary pollution sources include chemical plants, coal-fired power plants, oil refineries, petrochemical plants, 
nuclear waste disposal activity, large livestock farms, PVC factories, and other heavy industry. Acid rain, a byproduct of coal burning, has rendered tens of thousands of lakes in the Adirondack and Appalachian Mountains too acidic for most aquatic life. Ordinary municipal landfills are the source of many chemical substances entering the soil environment and often groundwater, emanating from a wide variety of refuse accepted, especially substances illegally discarded there, or from pre-1970 landfills that may have been subject to little or no U.S. or EU control. Some of the more common soil contaminants are chlorinated hydrocarbons, used to make PVC, and various pesticides like DDT, other hydrocarbon compounds like benzene, and heavy metals such as chromium, cadmium, lead, zinc, and arsenic. Organic wastes such as sewage and farm waste impose high oxygen demands on the receiving water, leading to oxygen depletion with potentially severe impacts on the whole ecosystem. Industries discharge a variety of pollutants in their wastewater, including heavy metals, organic toxins, oils, nutrients, and solids. Silt bearing runoff from many activities, including construction sites, forestry, and farms, can inhibit the penetration of sunlight through the water column, restricting photosynthesis and causing blanketing of the lake or riverbed, which in turn damages the ecology. Water tables are falling and rivers running dry in many or most countries, including the United States, China, India, and Pakistan. Most fresh water goes to irrigation, which has expanded to feed growing populations. The most widely quoted world figure is a 1997 study done for the UN Commission on Sustainable Development. It may be dated, but even then, it estimated that one-third of the world's population suffered water stress and that the figure would rise to two-thirds by 2025. One-fifth of the world's population did not have access to clean, fresh water, and half the population of less developed countries suffered from water and foodborne disease. It described population growth as first among the causes of the problems. Climate change will make the water crisis much worse. There will be more droughts, more damaging floods and storms, higher temperatures, and thus swifter evaporation, faster runoff of mountain streams, and therefore a more erratic water supply. Agriculture will not be able to support the present human populations. Fertilizer is the most obvious component of that equation. Modern nitrogenous commercial fertilizer is made by using natural gas or coal and petroleum to pull molecular nitrogen from the air and add hydrogen. It will become more and more expensive as fossil fuels decline. Phosphates and potassium fertilizer are also necessities. Both are mined, not manufactured, and we need a lot of them. Known world reserves of phosphates amount to 88 years of current consumption. About 150 million tons of those fertilizers are shipped annually, much of it for long distances. That will become much more expensive and laborious as energy costs rise. Fossil energy is also used to produce pesticides. Substitutes must eventually be found. And regardless of the food we can produce, there is still the problem of getting it to those who need it. Carrying capacity is a tremendously limiting factor. Clearly, we have a convergence of problems that are all negatively impacted by population growth. Yet religious asswipes like Ian Juby persist with the notion that we should continue to reproduce with impunity. The Earth can only support so many of us, and we've already passed that threshold. But if you think we can breed like bunnies, and Jesus will just do his magic loaves and fishes routine to make our finite resources last forever, Error, 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 error.